Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three of the first ever Logan Center Blues Fest. Thank you all so much for being here, and we'd also like to thank the Reva and David Logan Foundation, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, and everybody who sat on the very first advisory committee to help put this first festival together. One of the things that we said from the beginning is that we wanted to make sure we were archiving the stories of blues musicians and having conversations about the field, about people who are influenced by the blues, about the South side and the blues and we're going to continue to explore multiple themes over the next couple of years so you're here to kick that panel discussion series off with us today. Um, I'd like to welcome Mickey Dietler who's a professor of anthropology here at the University of Chicago and teaches a course about the Chicago blues and often inviting working Chicago blues musicians to come and speak with students here on campus. We were lucky to have him on our initial advisory committee and he will be introducing all of the panelists today. Uh, without further ado, we uh, welcome Mickey Dietler to invite uh, Mike Ledbetter, Deidre Farr, Melody Angel, and Billy Branch to talk about the future of the blues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the uh, Logan Blues Fest panel discussion on the future of the blues. Um, and we have, uh, we're very privileged this afternoon to have four extraordinary blues artists here who have very different experiences of, uh, of the blues here in Chicago. And uh, I'd like to just get out of the way as quickly as possible and get to the comments because that's what you came to hear. But I first want to offer at least a brief introduction to each of them. And my first question to them, will ask them to talk a little bit more about their experiences in the blues, their, their career. But uh, I first wanted to just say a few words um, to give a little bit of background and also to say a few things that they might be too modest to point out themselves. So, <laughs> starting, with the, uh, starting with the ladies, uh, Dietra Farr, who is here on, the, on my right, uh, was born in Chicago and began singing at a, a very early age. And she was already recording professionally by the time she was 18 years old. And I just learned earlier that she actually got her start singing here on the campus at <laughs> Blues, yeah, here at Mandel Hall, uh, not Mandel Hall, at the Shoreland, uh, in a rather impromptu affair that she can perhaps tell you about later. Uh, over the years, she has developed into an iconic figure in the great tradition of powerful Chicago blues singers. And she has a distinguished international reputation and has performed on stages around the world for many years. She has been nominated for uh, many awards in Europe and the United States. And among the honors uh, she has won, I'll mention here simply a few of them. Um, in 2015, she was inducted into the Chicago Blues Hall of Fame as a legendary blues artist. Uh, in 2016, the National Southern Soul Foundation named her the most uh, popular blues artist. And uh, just this year, she received the Coco Taylor Queen of the Blues Award from the uh, Use uh, Blues Foundation. And I should also mention that she has a bachelor's degree in journalism from Columbia College, and she writes a regular column in Living Blues Magazine. Oops. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so uh, next, uh, Melody Angel is a, a born and raised Southsider who also began singing at a very early age. Uh, perhaps even earlier than, than Deidre. And she soon became an electric guitar master as well. But she also is a, a multi-talented musician who can also play drums, bass, and piano. And her recently released CD called In the Fire has already been attracting rave reviews. And she has begun to be recognized as a forceful original voice for the younger generation of blues and blues rock artists. And she powerfully weaves together um, that is back together, the uh, blues with the music genres that the blues gave birth to, including particularly uh, rock and soul. And uh, one also gets a very strong uh, sense of political expression behind her music, something that is also apparent in the recent documentary that was made about her called uh, Black Girl Rock, uh, Life Lessons. And any of you who were lucky enough to see her perform here last night on this stage will recognize that she is an extraordinary, powerful young artist with a brilliant future ahead. 
Uh, Billy Branch uh, was also born in Chicago, but uh, took a long sabbatical in Southern California before returning to the city of Big Shoulders to earn a bachelor's degree in sociology from UIC. Political oh, political science, excuse me, wrong discipline. <laughs> uh, and he also caught uh, a permanent case of uh, blues fever on his return. And since then, he has gone on to establish an international reputation as one of the greatest harmonica players on the planet. Uh, maybe met many other planets as well, I'm not sure. <laughs> as well as uh, an original interpreter and champion of the Chicago blues tradition. Among his very long list of honors and accomplishments, let me just uh, mention a few here um, that include numerous W.C. Handy Blues Awards, an Emmy Award, an Addy Award, three Grammy nominations, and most recently winning the Little Walter Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award and the 2017 Living Blues Critics Award for Best Harmonica Player. I would also like to emphasize his pioneering uh, Blues in the Schools educational program that he began over three decades ago in Chicago and has since taken to a national and even an international audience, teaching children about the rich musical heritage of the blues. And this is a mission he will be continuing tomorrow in this very auditorium with the seats filled with uh, Chicago school children. Now finally, uh, to my left here, Mike Ledbetter was born and raised in the Chicago uh, suburb of Elgin. And he is an outstanding guitar player, uh, but is especially well known for uh, having one of the, the foremost uh, male blues vocalist um, voices. That is, he's absolutely astonishing at this. And he's using that uh, exceptional voice to push the classic Chicago blues tradition into new territory in the 21st century. Now, Mike actually has a formal training as an opera singer and had an eight-year career in the Chicago opera before uh, he gave it up for the blues. Now, the music, the, this is, the blues is the music that he knew before, but uh, turned his, uh, his extraordinary voice and operatic training towards uh, playing the blues. Now, he spent uh, seven formative years uh, of apprenticeship with the Nick Moss Band before setting off on a career of collaborative projects with other great Chicago blues artists, including most recently with uh, Dan Carelli, Billy Branch's former lead guitar player. Uh, with whom he was performing last night here at the Blues Fest. And also with Mike Welch, uh, with whom he has recorded a, a powerful album called Right Place, Right Time. So anyway, without standing in the way anymore, let's now get to the discussion that you have all come to hear on the future of the blues. And I wanted to start off with uh, just a little uh, retrospective question, um, uh, which is that uh, all of you were born in Chicago, or at least Chicago suburbs, um, but you all came to the blues at different times and from di very different directions. So I was wondering if you could start off by just telling us a little bit about your personal path to becoming a blues musician. That is, what drew you to the music? How did you learn to play the blues? And how did you work your way to becoming a professional blues artist? So I don't know where we, we can start, uh, perhaps on the end down here with Dietra, <laughs> and then just work across okay. the stage. Um, the first music that I ever heard was actually blues because my father was a great blues lover and I, he loved Muddy Waters and um, Lightning Hopkins and for some reason, he was born in Chicago as well, for some reason he loved the Texas guys, uh, Lowell Folsom. But anyway, um, that's the first music I heard, but I always wanted to be a soul singer. My generation was into Motown, Stax, you know. And then when Al Green came out in the 70s, oh, Lord. But that's what, that was my music, is the uh, soul music of the 60s. But I did listen to blues all the time, and I enjoyed it. So in my college years, I was working at the University of Chicago at the Shoreland Dormitory, which it's not there anymore, is it? It's, apartment. it's an apartment building? OK. I was working there as a desk clerk while I was going to Columbia College. And Phil Guy, which is Buddy Guy's younger brother, he came there with his band to perform for the students. And one of the students walked over to my desk and he said, D, I dare you to go up and sing with that band. <laughs> so this was 1980. 
and I told the switchboard operator, switchboard operator, that's how long ago this was, watch my desk. <laughs> so I went up, and between songs, I asked Phil if I could sing a song. And he said, sure, what you want to sing? And I said, steal away and see. <laughs> now, the kids didn't know I was a singer. They didn't, had no idea. So I sang with them, and everybody was shocked. And after the, sh the performance, Phil came over to the desk, and he said, you sing pretty good. You ought to come to some of my shows. So he started me to come into the checkerboard and Teresa's, and next thing I knew, I was a blues singer. <laughs> That's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. So don't dare me, because I'll do it. <laughs> uh, I try to make this as brief as possible, but as Mickey, uh, Professor Dietler mentioned, I, I was born here, moved to Los Angeles. I came back here to attend uh, UIC. And uh, before I started my classes, I uh, I had picked up the harmonica at about age 11. I taught myself how to play. Why? I don't know. I never heard anybody play. I never saw it, but I had a harmonica. So when I came back to Chicago, I saw in the newspaper there was a free festival. I never heard blues, never liked blues, knew nothing about blues. This festival happened to be, uh, looking back, the greatest blues festival ever produced in history. And, some of the names included Bo Diddley, Junior Wells, Buddy Guy, Big Mama Thornton, uh, James Cotton, Big Walter Horton, and it was pr and about 30 more uh, legendary names, Honey Boy Edwards, many, many more. And it was produced by Willie Dixon. And <clears throat> I was just blown away. I was completely blown away, and it was as if that harmonica had prepared me for that day. And seven years later, I was Willie Dixon's harmonica player. Wow. <laughs> so the blues was all around on campus. One of my best friends, uh, his mother was Junior Wells' girlfriend, so he'd take me down to Teresa's Lounge, which was the home of Junior Wells, and that's pretty much when I started sitting in. All right, you got to follow that. <laughs> I, uh, I got started in blues when I figured out that I couldn't make a living singing opera, pretty much. And I, I get this most from people. They say, wait a minute, you gave up singing opera to make money, so you came to blues? <laughs> yeah, I did. So. I don't know if I'm the most intelligent person in the world, but I, I like blues. So I, uh, I was very lucky to come to blues music in a, uh, I started coming around probably about 2010, very recently. Um, and uh, I started going to the clubs, trying to see if, uh, if anybody needed a vocalist, you know? Because I, I came up, before I was a classical musician, I sang gospel music. I came up and, you know, going, going with my grandma to, to you know, St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, you know, I sang soul, jazz, R&B, everything else. That's what I came up, that's where I come from, and blues as well. So, um, I started going to the club, seeing if anybody needed a vocalist, you know, uh, uh, any guitar players. And uh, for the most part, guitar players in Chicago, they, they sing too. Uh, so nobody was really biting when I, when I was sending the reel out there. So I, I was lucky enough to meet a guy named Nick Moss um, for a very long time now. He was considered, you know, one of the torchbearers of Chicago blues, traditional blues. And, uh, you know, I got to be friends with him, and he was trying to get me jobs too. And, uh, you know, nobody else was biting, because, you know, one more guy on the stage is another guy to pay. 
You know, so if a, if a, if a guitar can, if a guitar player can sing, or if a harp player can sing, you know, whether it's whether they're a great singer or not, I mean, it doesn't really matter. So uh, I I went to a, to a studio with this guy Nick Moss, and uh, he said, "Hey man, you a great? You want you want to put down some some backing vocals on my new album?" I said, "All right, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah." Um, yeah, let's get you on this song. I think you would fit on this song. I ended up singing background vocals on nine tracks that day, since the first one went so well. And he said, hey man, my songs are not gonna sound the same without you. You just come on the road with me. Now, I was hi, <laughs> you know. I never really played in, I mean, I never really got to start playing in blues clubs in Chicago. And then all of a sudden, I was playing over 200 dates a year on the road. So I got very, very lucky to already, you know, come into an already established band. Um, how I learned how to play blues, um, basically, um, my old boss said, all right, man, I'm going to give you every blues record that I've ever owned, okay? You know, MP3s, they're, they're a beautiful thing, <laughs> you know, uh, you know um, for guys like me who want to learn everything. So he said, look, if you do as much homework as, if, he, if you do half as much homework as I did, because Nick, his thing, he was a bass player. He played with Willie Big Eye Smith, you know, in the legendary blues band. He played uh, uh, bass for Jimmy Dawkins. Then he started playing guitar for Jimmy Rogers. These are, these are all guys that, you know, these are all the, you know, what the guys that we know that uh, pretty much made what, what we know as Chicago blues, all right? These are the guys that set the nucleus and said, here it is. So I said, all right, well, if I'm learning from this guy, I'm learning, you know, it's, it's kind of the middleman of learning from the Chicago Blues Masters. So I did as much homework as I could and learned how to play and learned how to sing just by uh, listening and watching and being a product of, uh, you know, technology, I suppose. But uh, yeah, that's how I got my start and now I'm a, now I'm a professional musician. <laughs> Um, well, I was just obsessed with the guitar. I always sang. I always sang. I don't really remember not singing, so I don't really know when I started. I guess my mom could tell you maybe five or six or something, but I always sang. But when I was seven years old, I saw this movie Purple Rain, and um, the first scene is this guy, this really pretty guy, uh, coming down the street on a motorcycle and he jumps on to the stage and you know and they're saying you know dearly beloved we're gathered here today to get through this thing called life and then this guy comes out the smoke and he's playing let's go crazy and he goes into this solo and I'm just sitting there like this is the best thing I've ever seen <laughs> This sound is the best sound I've ever heard. Like, I was so obsessed for, so I was seven. So for seven years, I begged my mama, just please give me a guitar. Every Christmas, every birthday, I'm looking under the tree. I'm waiting and saying, maybe this is it. It's going to be there, y'all. It's about to be there. It wasn't there. So <laughs> when I was 14, um, she finally came home from a pawn shop with uh with a fender guitar and i was just so excited and i picked it up and i just thought that i would just magically be able to play <laughs> so i just started i strummed my first chord or whatever it was and it sounded horrible and i was like oh no what am i gonna do now i can't play it so anyway i i ended up teaching myself how to play just i play by ear so i just listened to the radio and every day after school, I would come home and just try to figure out something else. And guitar, 
my love for guitar led me to seek out guitar players. So of course it started with Prince and Prince, so Prince kind of led me back. It started with Prince and then I found Jimi Hendrix. And then Jimmy is the one that led me to all the blues players because he has such a blues influence in his music. And when I started looking him up on YouTube, he would mention guys like Freddie King and Albert King and B.B. King. And so I was like, well, who are they? So then I looked them up. And then so my kind of love for guitar is what led me to the blues, because when I started to hear them play, I really loved what they were doing, too. And I learned so much about guitar from trying to do their licks and everything. So and then when I got older, I want to say like, 18, 19, then I really started to understand the words, like what they were saying. And that's when I really started getting impacted, like, man, they're really just pouring out their hearts on these songs. And I could do that, too. So I learned a lot about being honest and being truthful in my music through listening to blues songs. So it was just like my education, basically. And that's how I got started. Thank you very much. Um, one constantly hears the phrase, keeping the blues alive in publications and at concerts and festivals like this. And uh, I wonder if you could just say a few words about how healthy you think the blues actually is and what kind of a future does it have? <laughs> you saw me getting ready. <laughs> The blues is in no danger of dying. The blues is not on life support. The blues is played in every country that you can think of. It's even a blues festival in the Himalaya mountains. It's in no danger. Now, the problem might be what the blues is looking like. The color, we're going to talk about race, because that's why you moved around, because you know I'm going there. When I started singing blues um, 36, 35 years ago, um, it was a predominantly black um, genre. The musicians, I mean, there's, there was always uh, white people playing blues when I came on the scene. But suddenly, you know, it's starting to shift now and we're seeing um, all white blues festivals. <laughs> we're being excluded, so that that is like, shocking because 35 years ago we would lose jobs just having too many white guys in the band. I lost my gig at the Kingston Mines for having a white bass player. I was told to get rid of him or quit, so I quit. That was Harlan Turson. I'm going to say his name. He knows it's the truth. And I'm not fi I didn't hire him because he was white, and I'm not going to fire him because he's white. And that's just me. So that was in 1984, and I haven't been back there since. Now you know why. I'm, you know now you understand me. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I would just say that the the color of the blues is changing. It's, it's I'm seeing it seeing it in uh, Europe, in other places. So, um, but the music itself is in no danger of dying. Too many people love it. Thank you. Wow. Uh, you had to open up that can of worms. So. Hey, man. Um, <laughs> without, uh, it, the, you know, there's, there's uh, four of us here, and, and uh, each one of these questions can, can be an hour in itself. So it's, I try to keep this as brief. But um, what Dietro was touching on is what she mentioned is a major concern uh, as uh, this is inherent in the question it's not the you know the direct answer to the, to your question but uh, <clears throat> just to touch really briefly uh, the irony is that as African American artists we find ourselves marginalized from our culture and uh, in many cases we are subjected to 
being passed over or subjected to much lower wages than what we perceive as sometimes <clears throat> less capable white artists. And, uh, and as she says, it's, you know, the blues is a brotherhood. We have uh, Dan Corelli was my guitarist for about seven years. Uh, my piano player is uh, Japanese. It's not that we have any resentment towards non-black players, but we do face the um, <clears throat> we face the challenge of uh, maintaining inclusion of our own historical cultural legacy. And um, so in, uh, more direct to your question, I just wanted to, to hit on that. It, it's, it's a reality. Uh, we talk about this amongst ourselves all the time, all the time. And uh, it's, it's a real issue that and probably because of the current political climate that we're dwelling in right now, uh, <clears throat> these things, it's time, they have to be addressed. You know, they've been swept under the rug. Uh, America is finally facing the challenge of the dialogue that it never had. And um, so the blues is, it's here as DJ, it, it's vibrant. Chicago is, looks like it's taking more steps to embrace this great historical legacy which spawned all of the rock and roll movement, which is the foundation of all of America's music. You know, the story of the Rolling Stones would not, <clears throat> took their name from the song of the same, uh, title of the same by Muddy Waters. And it's time for Chicago to really push this. Like when you go to Memphis, you walk off the, uh, in the airport, you see Elvis Presley, B.B. King, you know, so it's time for Chicago to do this. That's a great thing that he just said. When you walk out, when you walk out in the airport in Memphis, you see B.B. King. Chicago does not show enough love to... We're, we're supposed to, I mean, when you think Chicago, you think blues. Why do we not, why do we not take advantage and show everyone what this great city has brought to the world? Now, keeping the blues alive. Um, I completely agree with everything with everything that these two legends have said. Um, one major thing to me is the, the, the good thing that's what's happening right now is there is quite the influx of young black artists and that's only been happening in the past, I don't know, in the past like few years, like I've been, I've been really seeing uh, quite a bit of younger black guys going out there and going, all right, I'm gonna play some blues. Before that, you know, and it, 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 it seems like, it, it's like if you go out to any club, how many bands do you see playing blues and it's, and it's an all white band? You see a lot of it, you know, and and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Music, good music is good music. But the thing about keeping the blues alive is, and the thing that, it, it, when it, when do you hear blues on the radio? <laughs> who said who said midnight? <laughs> the only time that you can hear blues on the radio. Yeah, yeah, you can hear it in commercials, you can hear it on the radio at 3 a.m. Young black, young black people aren't as, you know, exposed to blues as, as, as they should be. This is their culture. This is, you know, this is where we come from. So it's a good thing that, uh, I'll, I'll say Gary Clark Jr. is doing a great thing for blues right now, all right? Now, 
Um, a lot of people got hip to him. If you don't know who Gary Clark Jr. is, he's probably one of the biggest blues acts. Um, Billy. <laughs> He's probably the biggest blues act in the world. I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> I'm enjoying the shuffle while. I'm... <laughs> it's all right, man. You, yeah, you all know, no, no. That's what I say. I enjoy it. Hey, while I'm while I'm waiting, I'm digging it. So, I. I had the pleasure to, when I was in the Nick Moss band, probably about four years ago, I got the pleasure to open for Gary Clark Jr. Now, one of the most beautiful things that I have seen and that I have experienced in my short career, I got to play for people my age, first of all, and I got off stage and then I watched this guy's show. Now, people got really hip to him through, you know, his, you know, more, more kind of rock tunes and stuff like that, and that's, that's awesome. But then you see this guy's entire show, and he's playing pretty much nothing but B.B. King and Magic Sam uh, grooves just to his songs. Now, to look out at an audience and see thousands of young people half of them being young black kids, swaying and grooving and just loving blues music. I don't even think they know that it's really blues music because it's, you know, but to see that was a really beautiful thing. So that's why I said that Gary, Gary Clark Jr. is doing a wonderful thing for blues music right now because he is, he's kind of what Stevie Ray was in the 80s, like making blues cool, but he's doing it for for black kids again, and he's bringing, he's bringing the music back to his people. And uh, that's an important thing, you know? Everyone, everyone should be able to play, but it's important that, that young black people really carry, really carry it on. That's, all, that's what I have to say about it. <laughs> Um, for me, it's a little, I guess it's a little different. Um, I submit my, st I'll just go back by facts and I let people just, you tell me what's wrong with this picture. I send my stuff around to every blues festival in the world, every single year. And it's only this past, these past two years that I've had one yes out of, let's say, 200 submissions. And this is in the U.S. and overseas. I, got, I had one yes come from the Chicago Blues Fest um, a year ago. And then um, in early 2016, I got one more from the Byron Bay Blues Fest. But I have been submitting to all of these festivals for the past six or seven years. You want to know, like, you get to the inclusion thing. Because it's like, I'm looking at these blues festivals and it's all these white boys on the set. And I mean, yes, that's cool and everything, but you're saying, I can't come up there and play some blues, but all of them can, all over the world, everywhere. I can't play nowhere, and I'm asking and begging you if I can play the blues. No. I mean, it's just no after no after no. And then I had people tell me, what can we do to get more young black people into, into blues? It's like, <laughs> you got to give us a gig. You know, I'm, out, I'm begging you. Now, you're not going to find a lot of young black people begging to play the blues, right? And you have one, and you still say no to that person. Now, every now and then, like, he mentioned Gary Clark Jr. Can we get a second? Can we, get, can we say a third? No. 
because it's always just like one. And then that's the one that everybody talks about, but where's two and three and four and five? We, we only let one in, and then we use that, and I say we because we are society, whether you black, white, Asian, whatever. We only let one black person in to do something different. And then we use them as an example of, it's changing out here. That's what we did with Obama. He's the president, a black man's president. Racism is gone. Yay! You know, like, like, let's just be real. That's what happened. Yeah. And it's always just that one. So what I'm saying is, is that, yes, like she said, of course, the blues ain't going nowhere. Them people be filling them stadiums up for the blues festivals all over the world. I watch them on YouTube because I ain't there. So I know that they're packed full of people, but they're not including us. I should be able to play the blues on a regular basis if I want. Because it does come from my community. It does That's come right. from my culture. Right. It shouldn't be something that I have to get approval from. From, I'm sorry, white promoters. Why, why do I have to get approval from you to play the music that's running through my veins? And I think that that is... When I, when I invite my friends that are in their 20s to my shows, they come to Buddy Guys and watch me play. And they're up and they're dancing and they're having a great time. Now, if that was something like he was saying at, at, at the Gary Clark Jr. shows, they obviously would enjoy it if they got to see it more often. And that's where I'm at with it. Can I say something on that? Sure. It amazes me that it's okay for blues festivals to be all white or whatever. But can you imagine if it was a country and western festival <laughs> and it was a <laughs> all black? <laughs> okay, go ahead, ask another. Yeah. <laughs> no, really, can you imagine? Would that be okay to have an all black uh, country and western? Or a mariachi festival with no Mexicans? <laughs> or a po poker festival with no Polish people? I mean, why is that okay right. to exclude us? And we're not excluding white people. All of us have had white people in, that play with us. We're not racist. But why is it that we're being excluded? And I'm, we're watching this happen. Because 35 years ago, it was not like that. No. Not at all. So This, this is a topic that really could this could be the whole discussion and, and, and it's again it's the elephant in the room but uh, I think given the again the current political climate these issues are finally starting to be discussed intelligently because this was something that could not be touched it was taboo so hopefully we will have intelligent dialogue and uh, move forward from here and, and, and make some changes in advance, uh, um, you know, uh, eradicate some of these, these things that have plagued us for so long. Say one more thing on it? Sure. I too were all around the world. And all year, this, that's, this, that's my job. And it is changing, okay? I see a lot more, like I said, I see a lot more black bands out there really doing their thing. And a big part of that thing is young guys are really figuring out that they have to be business savvy too. Get yourself an agent, really get your stuff together, and don't just, you know, I mean, you, you, gotta, you, you gotta know the business and be about it in order to have a leg up. Because if you don't, like, like I said, like these people have been saying, you have to work extra hard. It's not right. 
but it's that that's the case and i don't i'm very happy that uh i'm very very happy that that things are looking on the up because like i said i am i'm seeing a change i don't know if anybody else is but i am so yeah Next you mean you time. see more young black people playing blues that's what you mean yeah yeah, yeah. i agree with they're you on that but playing. i don't see more black people getting work they're, 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 i'm on, i'm all over the world too they playing and stuff they it's playing just, it's just they playing. there's this difference between being out there and then there's and then being mainstream being somebody that a name that everybody knows like that what i'm saying is of course i know a, a bunch of young black musicians that's playing the blues and playing rock and playing metal and everything under the sun i'm saying mainstream gary clark jr Name name another mainstream like, name, name like, another mainstream blues act. We used to call that token, name, name the token one. black person. That's name, what name, yeah, name that's what I'm talking about. Blues act. Yeah, but I'm seeing blues festivals with no black Joe people. Joe Bonamassa, John Mayer. What's that other boy's name? Johnny Lang. Uh, what's that other boy's name? Like I could keep going. I don't know all their names, but, but I can show needed. you the list of them that are out they've won grammys they've gone platinum they're on tour right now playing the blues there's another one i mean you know you can you can like i said you can you can slice it any way you want but it is it's self-evident and the change whether it's small or not, we need it to be big. We need the changes to be bigger and to be long lasting. And that, that's my issue with it. Regardless of me, I'm saying I see the subtle changes, but I'm saying how can we make, make it bigger, make you a household name? Like, why isn't that easier? You have the talent, you're touring everywhere, why why is it so hard it shouldn't be and that's what i'm saying like we need to find a bigger catapult like they have they can have one big song or one whatever and be out there and it's big and that's it and i'm just saying it would be better for the future of the blues as far as young black people go if there was a bigger push for them when they get started. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so is this on purpose or is it just well, what what it should about racism? Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, you want to. I mean, you make money. You know how much money that they make. I mean, they make a lot of money from these shows. They make a lot of money performing at these shows. That's money that's not going into his pocket or her pocket or mine. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's a case of, well, I have it and I want it and I'm not sharing it. Instead of opening the doors to people who love it. Can, uh, since we're on this, can we continue on this? Sure, this, this is great. Um, okay. I got one. Um, <laughs> again, briefly, because... Uh, I know we got time considerations. Um, there's, there's quite a few factors involved in this, and some of them were touched on. You don't see the blues on television very often. You don't see legitimate, authentic uh, blues players on television. The Grammy Awards, the, the BET Awards, the, all the awards, you never see blue, or very rarely, and usually it is a white group representing the blues. Um, I believe, and I think this is one of the questions coming up, uh, that when you say we, who is we? What is we? Uh, <clears throat> as much as we are uh, um, in anxiety over the, the situation as African-American artists, I believe the answer 
falls uh, to a large degree to the African-American community. Uh, when you see uh, the rap and hip hop artists, some of them who are now billionaires, that have the resources, when you see the R&B and the soul uh, stars, um, one thing to Beyonce's credit was, and whether you dispute the validity, uh, historical validity of this movie, she was the executive producer behind Cadillac Records. Now, there was debate on the historical accur accuracy, but that movie brought the names of Holland Wolf, Muddy Waters, Little Walter, Willie Dixon to a whole new generation. A lot of black people, a lot of black kids now know these names because Beyonce did that. And I think the answer lies in more of that effort, more African Americans coming to uh, the rescue, putting forth the financial and uh, the attention and the resource, because they're there now. You have a lot of black millionaires now in the sports and entertainment world. You got Oprah and on and on and on. So if you're, we're waiting for somebody to save us, it ain't going to happen. It's time for us to pick up the slack. Thank you. Uh, we're clearly not going to get to all the questions, but, <laughs> but, the, but this is great. I mean, this is a really a platform for the musicians to express what they want to talk about, not to just follow a bunch of questions that I have prepared. So, but I, I did want to ask um, perhaps one last combined question here, which is about uh, the centrality of Chicago to the, to the blues. I mean, Chicago has been the real center of urban blues music since the Great Migration since the 1930s, and has undergone a series of stylistic transformations, really revolutions in the music. Uh, but I wanted to ask um, all of you how central you see Chicago's role continuing to be in the blues, and also what the city is doing to support that. Because uh, this is clearly a huge resource in the city's publicity for itself, and it's a big cultural attraction for lots of people around the world. People fly over from Europe to come and hear the blues. So what would you like to see the city do to uh, not keep the blues alive, but keep the blues musicians alive? To yes, I would like to see the city love the blues a little more. I mean, all the music, great music has come out of this city. And I've always been embarrassed that Chicago doesn't honor the blues the way it should, but now when they go downtown Chicago, they can see Muddy Waters' mural, Biggest Day, which brings me to tears, because um, when he came to Chicago, black people couldn't even shop downtown. So this is major. We have an upcoming uh, blues museum coming to the Loop. Billy and I are on the board of that. So, th you know, little things, it's, it's progress. You know, so that's what I'll say about that. Mm -hmm. um, Chicago does offer the largest free blues musical festival, which is the uh, Chicago's uh, draws more tourists from internationally than any other event. And but again, we've t we've touched on this. I would like to see in, when I mentioned about when you walk off the airport in the airport in Memphis, the first thing you see is the iconic figures of the musicians that, uh, you know, that develop there. So we need to, blues should be everywhere. There should be Muddy Waters Boulevard, uh, Howlin' Wolf Avenue. Uh, it should be celebrated because this is the music. There would be no Led Zeppelin, no Roland, no Beatles, Elvis, there'd be none of it. Right. And it all took, it exploded right here. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I would like to see the blues in schools. I mean, if you're going to teach, if you're going to have a music class, first of all, bring back the music classes in city schools. Thank you very yes. much. And then if they're going to learn about music, they should learn about American music and it should go in chronological order. So that means the blues. They should learn the blues, learn how to play the blues as a group. 
and then see where that could get us. Right. So. Yeah. Well, perhaps this is the time to uh, open it up for a few questions from the audience, if we, uh, if we have some. Uh, I'm Tom Reaney. I'm from New England Public Radio. I came in for this weekend's uh, events here at Logan and um, have been uh, a, a deep um, follower, uh, life-changing experience as an early teenager when I first heard Muddy Waters. So I've been um, observing and connected with the music for over 50 years now. And I have to say that um, I think that it's so critical, as Billy suggested, that the community that gave birth to the music and that continu con could continue to nurture it, get more involved with it. Um, I remember B.B. Um, B. King before the, you know, this is in the 60s, B.B. talking about the absence of black people in his shows. Muddy Waters got booed at the Apollo Theater, early 60s in Harlem. Wow. So um, it's got to be a kind of uh, community base that I think your suggestion of more uh, music in the schools and more emphasis on blues, mm -hmm. especially. Get away from the shame. Some of the historical uh, complicated elements of this music has got to be addressed and, um, and, and, and knit together so that uh, there's a kind of renewal of pride and, uh, and community embracing uh, of the music. I've seen a similar thing happen in the last uh, 25 years, and I would credit Wynton Marsalis primarily with this kind of the resurrection of Louis Armstrong as the major 20th century musical figure. And Armstrong was a very kind of marginalized figure in a lot of ways because of, you know, heavy cultural associations that that we have with Armstrong and, uh, you know, the old legacy of minstrelsy and stuff like that. But um, it's a very complicated picture, and I'm so grateful to see you all embracing the music, playing it so beautifully. Melody, we heard you last night for the first time, and we're just really knocked out. And, Thank um, you. Um, but <clears throat> I think that these festivals, if I could just find it, you know, it has a lot to do with the demographics, not only of what's on stage, but in the audience. And if these folks are turning out for festivals, Chicago, Boston, Newport, uh, Mississippi, and the audience is primarily white, then, you know, they, they've got a lot to do with who's getting booked at the festivals and, uh, and these higher paying, more prominent um, uh, venues like that. And uh, so I think more African-Americans in the house will mean more African-Americans booked and on stages uh, in those same houses and festivals too. Thank you. Can I address that? I can. Yeah. One of the problems with, uh, well, it's not a problem. It's, it's, it's the nature of black people to be innovative in music. We do not stop creating. So what happens is we do, we got a thing that we're into, and then something else happens, and then something else happens. We change the language. I hear newscasters talking hip hop language. Black people will not stay in the same place. And that's one of the reasons why they love a certain type of music for a while. And then they have a tendency that something new, something new comes along. And we're constantly, constantly innovative. I think white people are more traditional. They'll love the same thing the rest of their life. But we're just not like that. We're creative all the time. Question and then, yeah. Go ahead. Are you sure? Well, now I'm not done, but go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Keep going, Deidre. No, no, no. I'm just saying that is one of the reasons why we move on in music, you know, and we don't stick with the traditions because we're not traditional. We are innovative. I think that's just the nature in, of the African American community. We don't change, we change our language constantly. What we used to say in the 60s, we don't say anymore. We got some new stuff we're saying. And we're always doing that. Billy. <laughs> yes, Sister Roach. <laughs> we're the Roach Pack. <laughs> One question over here. Yeah, when I came home from Vietnam in 74, I moved to Chicago from Indianapolis, Indiana, and a guy named Myron Weintraub, who was a student here in the 60s, he turned me on to the blues. I turned him on to Freddie Hubbard and, and Wes Montgomery and you know all those guys. And then he turned me on to the blues, and I was like, "Wow!" And the first album that he hit me with was that Paul Butterfield album, 
with the guy standing on the front. And but you can look around the audience here, there's like a handful of African Americans here. And it's, it's not an altogether bad thing, but like she said, the, we have to reach these young people. And it's very hard to do. When one out of every five CDs worldwide is a hip hop CD, that's huge. That's worldwide. So those guys, like Billy said, they're, they're commanding the dollars, but they don't have the education. They don't, you know, the, uh, the emotion doesn't point backwards. So, you know, it's easy to criticize. And, and the challenge in front of us is daunting, but the music is not gonna die. And if, and if it just has to be all white players performing it, I, I love Johnny Lang, um, I guess we're just gonna have to deal with it. But uh, the music's not gonna die. It's in good hands. Um, I, there's just no easy answers for this. And like what Billy kept saying with the climate of uh, the political climate now that's starting from the executive branch, that may turn out to be a good thing because he has foot in the mouth disease, something fierce. <laughs> and hopefully, it'll backfire on him. And that's all I got to say. Who is this, man? You, we should have had him up here, shit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is for Melody. Do you think um, a lot of people may have a problem with you because you're also an instrumentalist because I, I you know. Yeah, I didn't want to uh, bring now. that up, but uh, you know, I've, definitely, like, yeah. I've definitely been told um, quite a few times, you know, I'll sit there and I'll do the jams and I'll play and we'll go back and forth with guitar players and stuff and still at the end somebody will say, yeah, but you know, you could do a few songs without the guitar. And, Oh, you know, you should add like a, another guitar player to your band and like play some lead, you know, so you can focus on singing. That's what they say, you know, like you can focus more on singing, you know, and then blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but I, I can play. Yeah, yeah. It, and I understand, like, I'm not crazy. You still, there's two battles going on here. There's the battle of being black. That's one. And then there's the battle of being a woman. And, uh, and when, you, when you're a strong woman who's been raised very well, and that means you're educated and you have a mind of your own, you have an image of your own. There's people very intimidated by my hair. They've asked me to, you know, straighten it, okay? <laughs> You know, Girl, we do, talk. do more of a Beyonce thing, <laughs> literally, for word for word. Like, you, you're so pretty, why don't you straighten your head? So they, they always tell you something nice. It's always attached. So, so what I'm saying is, is that it's, it's so important to me at this point to, to get somewhere with this because I meet a lot of young girls and they see me play and the first thing out of their mouth when they talk to me is, you know, I don't want to get emotional, uh, but they'll say, how, do you, how are you doing that? You know, and, and I'll talk to them some more and say, what do you mean? And this one little girl said, because I did something like at a school and she said, I don't know, I just, I thought boys played electric guitar. And I was like, no, we, you know, obviously not. You saw me up there writing. She was like, yeah, I can't do that, though. And I sat with her, and I showed her something on the guitar, and I turned up the amp really loud so she could hear herself, you know, hit the thing. And you can see it in her eyes, you know. They want to do more. And that's what I try to tell people. Like, these young black kids, you see them on the corners, and you, you know, are they up to no good, this, that, and the other. They want so much more out of life than what they're presently getting. But nobody is supportive of that. Nobody is telling them. Nobody told me. Nobody said, 
yeah, girl, keep playing that guitar. You're going to be just fine with it. Nobody said that. If anything, they said the opposite. Yes, our community has to start, you know, being parents again and raising them and all of that, of course. And we're, we're working on that as a community, trying to say that as much as possible that we got to get our homes together. We got to get our home life together. But they also go to school eight hours a day. And when they don't have teachers that care about them, and when they don't have books, and when nobody is there for after school programming, I don't know what you expect them to do. I don't know what you expect their next step to be. And I think that we really need to put in to them if we want to get something out of them. And it's just, it's just really important. And like I said, being, being a woman, you have to, there's a line that you have to play. And it's so, it's so difficult with no support. And you have to be true to yourself. You have to be really smart and strong about this thing because, yeah, I mean, I could tell you, I could have had a record deal. I'm sitting here right now, I could have had a major record deal and been off and doing everything. All I had to do was change my hair. All I had to do was put my guitar down. Mm. All I had to do was wear more revealing clothing. They told me every little thing that I had to do. And too many of us say yes. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'll say. About it. I think we have time for about two more. There's one up here. Well, um, I spent most of my young life on stage. And we started out blowing horns, that's all we had was a bunch of horns and we played a lot of jazz. And one day I climbed on the piano and it became a jazz band. Then one day I opened my mouth and decided to sing. So it was R.B. Then all of a sudden there was another change. They began to rap. So rap was kind of different. But I was noticing uh, what the lady on the end said, that we're constantly changing. And we're always looking for what comes next. Our audience began to dwindle, and they begin to go more to the rap side. So I'm just wondering what's next. You know, it's, it's a constant changing thing with our people. We change from one thing to another because we, we, we have never had nothing to do but meet constant change since we were let go from slavery. Everything changed. Every few months there was a new change coming. So uh, like, like she said, it's it's what's next, because there's such a great change going on with our young people. Even the styles of rap has changed. So I'm just wondering what's next. Hi, uh, great panel. Um, we look back to uh, when Muddy Waters and the chess artists were top 10 material. It wasn't about hot guitars. It was about matching a great voice with a great song. I think blues is going to get over when blues people start taking time to write new, better, original tunes. We don't have a Willie Dixon with us anymore. I think we've got to look to uh, original material to uh, bring the blues up to date and matching it with that really good voice. And a good drummer wouldn't hurt either. Uh, Paul, that is happening. That is happening. People yeah. are writing very rich. I write tunes. mostly all of my songs. I don't and, know what you're talking but, about. But the issue is, again, you don't know it because there's no platform to hear it. It's happening. We all write original tunes all the time. Final question from Mike Kappas, part of our advisory committee. Thank you. 
Um, I'm Mike Kappas, a Rosebud agency I have for 37 years, and I represented from Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, Robert Cray, when there was about four cities in the world that would pay him $350, you know, and, and rose up to double platinum and everything. So I've been on the side of representing artists at all different stages. And I think actually, Melody, I think you were, the things you named off as, as challenges, I think are actually advantages. Uh, young black woman uh, playing guitar and even with a unique identity, for, you know, your hair and everything. I think it's an example of unique identity. I think everything boils back to uh, positive awareness to the degree that people will choose to go to see your concert or spend money on your album in addition to or instead of their other options. And that's it, really. And it's positive awareness. And I think that's what you don't have right now. That's the main thing. And I didn't know, I'd never seen you before. And I've been in this business a long time, 45 years or so, heavily on the blues. But you can get there and you can do it. And your great ideas about music in the schools, blues in the schools, really great ideas about, uh, you know, making Chicago show its pride in the blues like Memphis does in its music. Those are great ideas. And uh, you are up against the challenge of uh, very few upcoming African-American artists, but there are more, and I agree with Mike on that. I think it's starting to show, just like you said, in the last few years. And Hopefully there will be more of that, and there would be more if there's blues in the schools, because it's all about awareness, and so many people don't even know about this music. But you are up against those challenges, as everybody said, too, that people are moving on to something else. They moved on to R&B, to hip-hop, to rap and everything. And that's a challenge, is getting the attention of the young kids to, this, to their heritage. But uh, you're in a good position, Melody, I think, really. I think those, like I said, those things you call as challenges, I think are opportunities, really. And hopefully more people can come up and, and you can be a leader and, and they'll be following you. You know, all the time, I ran into it so many of the times, people have a concern about an artist that didn't fit nicely into a category. But the breakthrough, big breakthrough artists were the ones that didn't have a category. They were something special and new. And I think you can be that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any, thank you so much. Any final thoughts, comments from the panel? This, this, I think, is a, a very important conversation that we've been having, and one that I hope will be continued in uh, prominent venues in various places, because I think it's really important for the, the future of the music. And uh, so I, I want to thank all of our artists who have uh, really very thoughtfully reflected on these issues here and taken the time to, to come and grace our stage um, today. So thank you very much. Thank you.